Rabbi Manus Friedman is best known as YouTube's rabbi. Millions of people have heard his views on philosophy, religion, and really just his overall counsel. The thing I most appreciate about him is how he forces me to think deeper, more abstract. Oftentimes he'll answer my question with another question, and it shows me how much I can learn, and I love that. He says things that are provocative, which you'll see in this episode. This is Rabbi Manus Friedman, the provoker. What is your purpose right now? To answer your questions. <laughs> mm, okay, great. And my questions are on something that you've dealt with specifically, I mean, for years now. Well, I yes. mean, I would say you've been dealing with this for decades and now you're just really coming into it, right? With these actually putting out what you've been thinking about and writing about for a long time. Yes, I've been doing it for a long time. And the world has never responded as enthusiastically as now. Why do you think that is? Uh, COVID had something to do with it. People are much more thoughtful. They're not so busy, busy with busy stuff. So they're more thoughtful, they're more mature, and they're looking for these real answers, not distractions and entertainment. Yeah. Answers about meaning, about purpose, about what, what we're there to, what we're here to do. The question of purpose, which is a huge subject, it's universal. It has always been there. Great philosophers would ask, what is the purpose of life? And they would become famous for it. <laughs> for asking the question, yeah, right? Today, every kid asks the question. Mm. Why was I born? I didn't ask to be born. So what used to be great philosophy has now become everyday conversation. Yeah. Because we really need to know. The answers aren't immediate either. I mean, that's, that's what I find intriguing about it is that if you set out on that quest to find that answer, I mean, you're, you're not necessarily going to figure it out next month, next year. Well, you know, I'm not sure you can figure it out yourself. It's got to be, it's got to be something that has been around forever. It's been true forever. Mm. If you just come up with it, no, it's not going to be the right answer. Okay, so what I'm what I'm hearing from you with the being around forever, I, there's something that I've talked about with e even other guests that have said, you know, I there was a point I turned around, I looked at my life, and I realized something I'd been doing all along, I'd never put it together. This was always purpose. I had always been doing it, and now I'm just finally putting the words to it or, or putting the, 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 the conscious... I guess, definition to it. Is that what you're saying? Not that I've been always doing it, but that everybody's been doing it without realizing the, the significance of it. But most people, when they hear it, will say, I kind of thought that, I just never, not that they did it, but it was, it's, it, it, it's intuitively comfortable. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I would have said that <laughs> had I, Given it some more thought, yeah. So it's it it's it's easy to relate to because it's true. When did you first find yourself asking the question, "Why am I here? What's the purpose?" Well, the beauty of of the education that we got was that it actually encouraged the questioning, not from cynical, you know, uh, negative motivation. But because there are answers, and if you don't ask the question, you're not going to appreciate the answer. So I remember being 15, and we were sitting in class, and we're studying all of this, and we're observing all the commandments, and we're being very good boys. And we started discussing, like, why are we doing this? Mm. What's the purpose of it? What's the purpose, and what is our motivation? What are you doing it for? What are you doing it for? Those are heavy questions to ask as a teenager, I think. Yeah. But you think? do you think we're primed for it as teens and we're just dismissed for asking them? I think if you don't get the answer as a teenager, your life becomes difficult. Tell then me you're more. you're struggling. What, what was the answer that you got at, in your teenage years that helped you? Well, when I finally figured it out, with, of course, the help of all the teachers and all that, 
uh, the model that we that we all have always lived by, and and we're actually misled, is the is the picture of human beings being very needy, fragile, weak, helpless, dependent, either on the government, on the king, on the emperor, or whatever. Mm. <clears throat> or on God. So religion kind of reinforces the idea <clears throat> that you are so desperately needy. Hmm. And God can help you if he's in the mood. So you got to do something to get him in the mood that he should like you and take care of you and that kind of stuff. Is that sacrifice? Is that good deeds? Is that fasting? What are those things Every, that we're talking about? Whatever people could come up with they were willing to do just to get on his good side. <laughs> so, <clears throat> of course, but that's very hard and it hardly ever happens. So everybody's in trouble and you got to beg on your knees. And we found out that, that that's a distorted picture. That's a way for groups to control the masses. Did religion get it wrong? Oh, yeah. Yep. The truth of the matter is, this is, this is the real revolution, revelation, <clears throat> it's God who is needy. Whoever created the world must have been driven by a very intense need. You don't create a universe for nothing. <laughs> so the picture we're given is that God needs nothing. He is perfect. And we're in trouble all the time. <laughs> And I got to get a job, I got to make money, I got to pay the bills, I got to... Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I didn't create the world. Why am I paying the bills? Right. <laughs> I, I didn't create myself. Why do I have to redeem myself? Mm. Why do I have to prove myself? It's the other way around. And you started asking these questions at 15. Yeah. Were you ever called blasphemous? I'm still called blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it interesting. Yeah, as a rabbi, yeah, it's so interesting, and I, I, I do love that the times that I've spoken with you, I, I have felt like I, I've asked questions, and you've always taken what I've asked and and driven it even further, to to educate me truly to say, you're not thinking deep enough on this question. See, that's another very important principle. In order to really answer any question. You can either go wide, gather a lot of information, do a lot of research, and confuse yourself, <laughs> <laughs> or go deeper. The answer is just beneath the surface. Just go deeper. Don't, don't, don't run around all over the world looking. Take the subject and just go a little deeper, and the answers are there. Do you find that, that answers with life tend to be complex or do they tend to be simple and we just make them complex? They're extremely simple because truth can only be simple. Give me an example of something that you think people struggle with that is really quite simple. Well, let's, let's stick to the topic. Why are we here? We don't ask to be born. So why are we here? So people get depressed. So you put them on antidepressants. Why are we here if I didn't ask to be born? I don't ask to be born because I don't need to be. That is a very important fact of life. We don't ask to be born because we don't need to be born. So what is all this, you know, uh, you got to succeed and you got to, I, I got to nothing. I didn't ask for this. So don't put the burden on me, because I, okay, so if I didn't ask to be born, and like Mark Twain says, the most significant day in your life is to figure out why you were born, well, come on, figure it out. No, nobody's ever, nobody has ever come up with an answer. You don't think so? Give me, for an example, what does religion say? Why was I born? Uh, to exalt God, to, usually that. To execute God's love. So that. 
God's love can be felt around the world so that we can praise God. So it's that, an exaltation. Yeah, so that. Oh man, you're you're putting the questions on me. This I'm is sorry. difficult. No, I love <laughs> I love it. I love it. Keep it coming. So you're telling me what we're supposed to do, but why? Why? Praise God, nice, very nice. Yeah. And then what? Well, I, I think there's a level of, I mean, hopefully the place where I've gotten is that there's supposed to be some level of consciousness in all of it, that we're participating in this beautiful experiment called human life and human suffering, human love, um, all of the, the range of human emotions. So we feel them and we feel them fully. And then we find something to dedicate our lives to that brings us to like the higher level of consciousness. That's at least what's been true for me right now. That, that is, that's all correct. It's still not a why. Have you found the why? Like, what would be wrong for my saying, yeah, okay, that's very nice, but I don't want, I'm not interested. <laughs> there are people who say that. A lot of people. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's nice, but I don't have to. Yeah. So why? I don't know. What's the compelling reason? What do you think the compelling reason is? Okay, so just follow the, the, the simple logic. I didn't ask to be born because I don't need to be here. But you are here. But I am. But I am here. So Conclusion, what? I'm not here for my need. I'm here because someone needs me. Mm, is that someone, another person? It might be, but you got to start with whoever caused me to be here. So I blame my mother. <laughs> But my mother says, hey, I didn't ask to be born either. Yeah. Don't blame me. So just go back to Adam and Eve. You know what they're going to say? <laughs> I didn't ask to be born. Right, exactly. <laughs> so here's, here's the, the simple conclusion. Everyone in the universe has always had this question. Why am I here? What is the purpose? Now, why do we need a purpose? That seems like a uniquely human quality. Yes. To, to need meaning. Yeah. You're meaning and making machines, I right. feel like. All right. So what, what is the purpose of that cup? Oh, it doesn't have a purpose. Well, it does to me. It keeps my cold water cold and my hot water hot. Right. Otherwise. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's more pleasurable drinking. Do I need something like that? Absolutely not. No, but it does have a purpose. Yeah. Because if it didn't have a purpose, it probably wouldn't be here. Right. It'd be in the trash. It wouldn't exist. Yeah. Nobody would have invented it without its purpose. Yeah. Well, then does that go to need? Because usually with at least human invention, invention comes from need. Yes. And that's where we got tripped up. We thought that we're doing what we do because of our need. Today we're enlightened. Even the 10-year-old, I don't need. Thank you very much. I didn't ask to be born, so don't tell me I need to clean up my room. <laughs> I don't that's need. a particularly difficult child, I feel like. No, that's a brilliant kid. Yeah. And he's not depressed, and don't put him on antidepressants. <laughs> he's making a very true observation. Yeah. I didn't ask to be born. I don't need to be here, but I need to clean up my room. Mm. How does that happen? Yeah, that doesn't seem worthwhile enough, does it? How can it be my need? So, the, the, the obvious simple solution is, I am not here for my need because I have no needs. I am here because I am needed. Mm. Oh, I know. There's where the question of purpose comes from. Well, yeah. We have this inborn instinct. I'm here for a purpose. Now, why do I need a purpose? Well, because you were born into being needed. Exactly. So we have to discover... The reason who I or need, what? Right. The reason I need to know my purpose is because there is one. I'm not making it up. And without a purpose, then thank you very much. I don't need this. Mm. It shouldn't be here, right? But do you, do you believe everyone has a purpose? Yes. But it's not I have a purpose. I exist for a purpose. We mean whoever made me exist did so with a purpose in mind. Mm. So it's not really my purpose, or it's the purpose for me. Mm. So when God created us, 
It was not a mass production thing. Every individual for a particular purpose. Now, there is a common purpose, which we all share, obviously, to make the world his kind of a world. But each of us does it in a very individual, specific way that no one else duplicates. So when we say purpose, you're talking, you're talking God. You cannot ask, what is my purpose, if you don't believe in God. Mm. In other words, if you don't believe in a creator. Because purpose comes from whoever caused you to be here. If whatever caused you to be here didn't have a purpose, then you don't have a purpose and stop looking for it. <laughs> I did. I, I do find this question interesting. Um, purpose, I think, as a word, is so inextricably linked to spirituality uh, and maybe to, to religion, I think. Maybe to religion is probably the better word. And I, I find that some people just don't want to even hear that word. They don't want to talk about that word. And, and that's always interested me because I've, I've wondered if someone's inability to talk about purpose is their own, probably two things, they don't want to talk about religion. And then maybe they're so confused by the concept that the, the doing the deep dive, taking the time that you have to take to commit to that is just beyond something they're willing to spend time doing. I blame religion for undoing itself because instead of telling me what I'm needed for, the focus was always on what I need. I need to be saved, I need to be blessed, I need to be protected, I need to be chosen, I need to be pre precious, I, I need. Mm. And that's going in the wrong direction. We're done with that. We finally grew up. Do you think COVID helped us grow up? Yes, very much. I, I do think so many people, I mean, just by simple virtue of not being able to the, go to the grocery store every day, if we, you know, if we needed to stay home, we stayed home. Um, and tried to take as long as we could to be as self-sufficient as we could. We saw so many people go into nature. Uh, so many people leave cities, flee cities to just try to be self-sufficient. I, I, I find that interesting that you see that as the awakening. There, there, there is the self-sufficient and there's also the family ties. All of a sudden, we're so grateful for our, for our lives. We thought shopping was life. Right? We are and, a consumer And culture. entertainment was yeah. life, and travel was life, and work was life. And we found out, no, take all that away, and I still have a life, and a good one. Mm. So people are appreciating their spouses, people are appreciating their children. It's a, it's a much better world. Mm. But here's the problem. As we become more sophisticated, we develop more needs. Isn't Nobody ever needed as much as we need. Because yeah. the more you have, the more you need. So the needs are becoming a little annoying and a little depressing and heavy. It's too much. Yeah. We're complicating our own lives. I do believe that. I need relief, right? So what happens when you go for therapy? You come to the therapist and you say, I'm, I'm, I'm overburdened. I, I, I need a break. Ultimately, inevitably you find out from the therapist that you have many more needs than you were aware of, <laughs> right? Like your mother never really wanted to have you oh. <laughs> and you're competing with your, with your siblings and you're jealous of whatever and this is not helpful. Yeah. So you go to religion for relief. And what does religion tell you? You need more things. Those are all the things you need in this life. But when you die, oh, your needs are just beginning. <laughs> Come on, I can't, I can't, I can't handle yeah. this. There's something wrong with it. It's not, it's not that it's, it's uncomfortable and, and, and I didn't ask for this. No, it's wrong. It can't be true. That's why it's depressing. Mm. You burden me with something that isn't true to me, it's going to be depressing. Because it, it, it rubs me the wrong way. It's not me. So do you think the source of a, a lot of our depression might be our need? Yes. Our, our, we just, our mis misconceptions that we need more than we, yes. than we actually need. Right. And everyone we turn to just adds more needs. Mm. Oh, you don't need that. You need this. Yeah. 
Thank you. So, the truth of the matter is, it's been 5,000 years, and we finally figured it out. We don't need. Don't threaten me anymore, because it's not going to work. Mm. Don't tell me I better do this or I'll go to hell. Tell me why I'm here in the first place and how I got myself into this mess. Mm. Then I'll figure out what I'm doing. But you won't tell me why I'm here. You'll just tell me what my needs are. Mm. That doesn't sit well. So do you think we have any needs at all? I mean, human needs, there's water and food. We have one. If we want to survive. Okay. If we want to survive. That's a big if. That's, again, a threat. <laughs> you got to make some money and you got to be able to pay bills or you'll die. Yeah. Okay, stop threatening me, right? Children are, are wisening up and they're really brilliant these days. They're so, so much smarter than we were at that age. And what they're saying is, if you threaten me, it only proves that you don't have answers. Mm. So I'm not impressed with your threats. You know, Mrs. Reagan told teenagers not to mess around with drugs because it can kill you. Just say no. You know, teenagers are waiting for the punchline. Right. Yeah, so? It can kill you. Yeah, so? See, it's not working. <laughs> yeah. Death is no longer the motivation for life. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. All these years, we lived not to die. And don't you think we've we've created this idea that there is no choice, you know, that you've no, you have no choice in the matter. And so then people have, as you have started asking these questions too, of, wait a minute, there is a choice. And for someone to present a situation in the way of saying that there's no choice, though that inherently is wrong. There's always a choice. The reason we thought there was no choice is because you're going to die. Yeah, so... Not like I have to be here. Well, so then let's get back to the, the reason to live. So, the well, go back a little bit. I need to eat? Not true. It's not true. I need to sleep? No, it's not true. How, how often do I need to stay awake and I can't? How often do I need to continue my project, but I got to stop and eat because I haven't eaten in three hours? <laughs> so do I need to eat or do I need to stop needing to eat? So eating is not a need, it's a handicap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it does slow you down. Actually, my mother-in-law says this. She's a woman that spends a lot of time in the kitchen, and she says to me all the time, I wish that we didn't have to eat. I spend so much time in this kitchen. <laughs> and if we didn't eat, we would probably live forever. Because then we overdo it, right? And that's probably the next issue with needs. When we think we need something, then we over-need. We overindulge in the need. And it's unhealthy because it was unhealthy to begin with. Okay. So it's not really true that I need. Like, for example, this teenage boy is traveling overseas, an adventure. He arrives to wherever he was going, and he speaks to the, uh, to the mentor. The, he says, I need to call my mother. Which phone can I use? And the mentor says to him, you need? He says, yeah, I need to call my mother. You need? Mm. He says, I need to call my mother. And then he realizes what the guy is saying. He says, no, my, my mother needs me to call her. <laughs> And the mentor says, good, Yeah. you're starting to grow up. He doesn't need to call his mother. He's on an adventure. He's a teenage boy. He doesn't need to call his mother. Yeah. His mother needs him to call. Or I would like, I would like to call my mother. That's a different thing, too. That's a different expression. But only, only because she's sitting by the phone and waiting. Mm. So when I say I need to call my mother, it's like plagiarism. It's not your need, it's her need. Mm. Why do you claim it as yours? So, first of all, why, why would you want a need that you don't have to have? Yeah. Why would you burden yourself? And secondly, why are you lying? I, I think we're just taught those things. And until someone says, wake up, yeah. we don't even become aware of it. Yeah. So, do I need to eat? 
if I designed myself, I would never do this to me. Because <laughs> need... it slows you down. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's humiliating. I got to compete with the rabbit. I need a scarecrow to keep the rabbit away from my food. Uh, who is the, the, the guy is, the guy is uh, preparing some meat and there's a vegetarian and uh, he's a little upset. So, oh, you're killing the animal? He said, no, no, no. The animal was eating up your food, so I'm protecting you. Oh. Right? I like that spin. So who are we competing with? The bugs? We need pesticides because the bugs will eat what I want to eat? <laughs> you're competing with bugs? It's humiliating. But I didn't, I didn't design myself. If I designed myself, I wouldn't need to sleep. Why would I do that to myself? So none of the needs that I claim are mine are, are mine. I'm saddled with it. I didn't ask for it. I didn't do this. I didn't even agree to it. So it's not my need. My mother needs me to call her, not I need. So do you think that's kind of step one to figuring out Existence. It's, yes. It's the foundation of everything. Differentiating your actual needs from others? From, actual needs? From who really needs. Turns out it's not my mother. <laughs> it's the creator. That's a whole different God we're talking about now. I imagine you have to have started to live, you have to have started to live life differently when you started asking those questions. Everything changes. Everything changes. So what do I really need? Yeah, what do you need? I need to know who needs me. That's it. Tell me who needs me and I'm, and I'm, I'm good. So, okay, let me go with you here. So is that the foundation of purpose is just first figuring out not your own needs, the needs of others? The ultimate need, the original need that brought this whole thing into existence. Now, to not be needy is itself a massive blessing. <laughs> On top of that, to know that I am needed, oh my, this is heaven. Yeah. Well, because then there is, I'm going with you here, because there's this beautiful feeling when you've done something for someone and you know the old, the age old saying, age old saying to give is better than to receive. Not even so much that. It's more that when you give of yourself, or when you give of your time, when you help another person in some with way. One, that's... With one condition: give what is needed, not what you like to give. Because people who give what they like to give are abusive. Mm. Why abusive? They decide what you need or want. They give you what they think you should have. And then if you're not grateful, they beat you up. I have someone in my life like that, but we'll keep it. <laughs> we'll, keep it. we'll keep it here. It's so common. Yeah, it is. So what, then what is the foundational question there? Is it going to people you love or just going to people you see? And what, what do you well, need? If you're responding to being needed, then you'll do what is needed, not what you think hmm. is needed. So really, when I do for you what I think you need, I'm not thinking of you. I'm just trying to enhance myself. Yeah. So if you don't cooperate, I'm going to have to be nasty. I don't know that you're capable of it. I appreciate that. I appreciate the point. But I think what's interesting, what I'm hearing too, is that you almost have to get out of your own way for that. Yeah. Good way to put it. Stop tripping over your own needs. I think this is the future of psychology. Mm. In the future, somebody comes to a therapist and says, I, I, I need help. And they answer, you need, like the mentor says, you need to call your mother. Say it again. I need help. You need help. Did you ask to be born? How do you get to be needy? Is that a higher level, just a higher level of consciousness? Or yes. what do you, how, how would you describe it? It's just better. And call, it whatever, <laughs> call it whatever you want. It's ER, anything that you put an ER on. Right, you can, you can call it spiritual, mystical, high, I don't, it doesn't matter. 
So these questions feel very logical. At what point does purpose, like that bigger kind of word over here, at what point does that become spiritual? Good question. It's a very good question. Learning. You've been thinking. <laughs> I've been thinking. <clears throat> this is where loving God comes in. You're here because he needs you, which is great. Great compliment. Now you got to develop a passion for the purpose for which you exist. Hmm. So once we find out what the purpose is, we're, we're, on, we're on the right path. But you got to do it with a passion. How do you develop a passion? Love, pleasure, loyalty to the, to the purpose. In other words, flesh it out. Give it, give it, give it some character. Does it, Does it start with a curiosity? Not just obedience. Does it start with a curiosity towards something? It's more than curiosity. If this is why I'm here, I'm not just curious. <laughs> if this is why I'm here, I'm all in. So when God comes to Abraham, for example, and he calls him by his name, Abraham says, here I am. Meaning, now that we know, here I am means I'm totally available. I got nothing to do here. <laughs> I have no needs. I'm not preoccupied. <laughs> so if you need, please tell me. Mm. So it boils down to a very simple thing. Our choice in life, the ultimate choice, is to be needy or needed. That's pretty simple. To be needy is the beginnings of depression. To be needed is a purposeful life. Mm. Do you think we ourselves can create the situation where we're needed? Here's where I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm a mom, right? So here I've created these three children and I have created a situation where now I am needed. Yes. So in other words, it trickles down. If the creator needs you and you're aware of that, you're into the being needed mode. So if your children need you, you're already in that mode. Yeah, being needed is comfortable, not burdensome. So if the community needs you, okay. I'm into that, into that way of thinking and functioning. So being needed becomes very comfortable and natural. But if God doesn't need you and you're preoccupied with your needs, Anyone who needs you becomes the enemy. <laughs> because they take your energy, they take your time. You're not, you're not functioning in that mode of being needed. You're functioning as needy. Well, either help me or shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> let's talk about marriage. Okay. Marriage means I'm going to be needed. I've never thought of it that way. Because I think, I, at least in this country, I mean, when you marry someone, it's about love and uh, commitment and, well, commitment of time, commitment of self, uh, commitment of body. I, I guess I've never thought of it as need. It's an investment in my own welfare and my own happiness, my own future. It's a disaster. <laughs> Sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes it's wonderful and beautiful. <laughs> but sometimes it is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Because you're using a person to get what you need. Isn't that the definition of abuse? Look at these questions. When did you start asking that question? Were you married when you asked that question or was this before? <laughs> After we had our first fight. going to say, did your wife know that you started asking these questions? But that's the definition of marriage. The definition of marriage is, I will be needed. And that is so much more enjoyable than having your needs met. You never get contentment when something you need is fulfilled. You just move on to the next need. Mm. Contentment only comes when you know that you are needed and that you did what was needed of you. Mm. It's so basic. It is so absolutely simple. Yeah, right, going back to your original question. Truth is always simple. Mm. 
So if you're home and uh, alone and you have to make lunch, what are you going to do? For myself, it honestly, I, I just don't eat. Okay. I just don't eat. It's the craziest thing when I have all these children around. I'm cooking, I'm doing, I'm uh -huh. doing, meeting the needs, right? But when it's just me, I'm, I find that I'm not even hungry. Yeah. Don't, I just don't even do it. See, I need to I, eat. I don't have the need. Mm. Or if you're going to eat, you'll open a jar, you'll you know, some, some leftovers. Some yeah, right? leftovers, exactly. But if somebody call, calls up and says, can I come over for lunch? Then the spread comes out. Yeah. It's so much more enjoyable to be needed yeah. than to be needy. So that's the so, foundation of all of it, isn't it? So in marriage, we've, and this, this part of the book, mm. and the reason for the book, uh, in marriage, the, the presumption that we marry for love, and that is so encouraged, you fall in love, get married. Got to rethink that. Don't do that. Uh, tell me more. I'm hanging on every word right now. <laughs> Uh, this couple come and I say, we're very much in love. We want to get married. Would you do the wedding? I said, you're in love? They said, yes. I said, well, then why get married? Then why get married? For love. <laughs> you already have it. Mm. Too late. <laughs> it's too, you can't get married now. What are you doing? Mm. Oh, uh, committed. Uh, committed to what? Do you think these people knew that this was going to be the line of questioning no, you were going to start down? No, they were, they were totally shocked. But the idea of marrying for love is a horrible idea. So my first book, we came out in 1990, it's called Doesn't Anyone Blush Anymore? That's not the title I wanted. <laughs> I wanted to call it Shut Up, I Love You. Because <laughs> that really is the problem with marriage. I married you for love. Not for my own need for love? Is that what you're getting at? Or for because I love you? I love you. So I want to give you love and I want to get your love. You're giving me your opinion. Hey, I didn't marry you for that. Mm. Just shut up and love me. In other words, I married a part of you, not the rest of you. Mm. So the rest of you, I'm not interested in. Just the love. Hmm. Keep the love coming. So <laughs> <laughs> anything else, I, I'm not interested. Opinions keep to yourself. Dirty yeah. laundry keep your to yourself. Your personality, your moods, your needs. I don't want to hear about that. So then, what is the proper reason to get married, in your ah, opinion? There we go. The real reason is because it's terrible to be alone. I I know that so many people say, "Oh, this is," and they say it as a negative. Oh, this person can't be alone. That person can't be alone. They always have to be with someone. I, I actually say in a similar way to you, well, we aren't meant to be alone. Certainly there are great times to be alone, be one with your thoughts, to be lost in that. But we're not meant to be alone. Why? I think there's a need, uh -huh. a need for others. Needed. There's a need to be needed. There's a need to help. There's a part of life that is completely unaccessed until you give yourself. And again, I think motherhood, childbirth, I mean, that is the ultimate act of giving. You're giving your, you are giving everything you are in that, in that because time. Because it's needed, not because, because needed. you want to impose on people. Yeah, why would anyone choose that? <laughs> it's yeah, painful. It, it, it seems counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to be needed? Oh, it's just, it just feels so, I mean, it's exhilarating. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing when you are giving, because when you're giving true. that. It's true. You're right. It's You're true. You're created out of need. It's, it's your true nature. You are a needed creature. So the more you're needed, the more alive you are. Mm. So it's not who loves you. It's who needs you. Mm. So parents who tell their children, we love you so much, we love you so much, doesn't do it. Imagine parents who say, you know, we don't need you. <laughs> That sounds so hurtful to say it that way. We don't need you, but you're so cute. We'll keep you. <laughs> no, that doesn't work for a human being. That works for a pet. Yeah. Not for a human being. So when you get married, you are marrying in order to have someone other than you in need your you. life. Yeah. And what makes 
him other than you? He's got his own opinion. <laughs> he's got his own moods. They don't match yours. Ah, then he's not me. That's who I want to be married to. Yeah. But what we do instead is we love everything that feels right about the other person, but what makes him another person that we don't want to hear about. Mm. No, we don't really want another person. How does someone how does someone get to that point with a, a, with a potential partner then? I mean, are these just simply the conversations? Is it supposed to be a, a level of acceptance? I mean, what, what do you think someone should look for in, I mean, surveying the landscape and figuring out who the right person is for them? Well, I think the first rule is you meet somebody and you're thinking of marriage. Don't ask, do you love me? <laughs> ask, do you love marriage? Because if you don't love marriage, there's nothing more to discuss. Because we're going to get married. If you don't love it, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do marriage for me. Because then you're going to blame me for everything that goes wrong. <laughs> do marriage for the sake of marriage. And what is marriage? I'm not enough. Now, let's go back to God for a moment. Here we have God, infinite eternal, all-powerful, almighty, perfect in every way. And he creates a world. Why? Because he needed us, based on your line. What did he need? To be needed. Mm. So, it's not something that we can do for him. It's just being with him so that he's not alone. You know that Billy Joel song, Piano Man? Oh yeah, I love that one. My kids have harmonicas, like literally the three-year-old's playing a harmonica not well as we listen to Piano Man. Yes, very well aware. Love that song. So do you remember that line? They're sharing a drink they call loneliness, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but... Something and something gin is the next line. Yeah. But it's better than drinking alone. Yeah. There's loneliness and there is aloneness. Loneliness is a need. I need company. I need to talk to somebody. I'm, a, I'm afraid to be alone, uh, whatever. Right? So if you're lonely, you go to the bar and you share a drink called loneliness. <laughs> you can share your loneliness. What happens when you get home? You are then alone. You're in aloneness. Yeah. So what is wrong with aloneness? I'm, I... Personally, don't find anything wrong with being alone when you certainly when you, you know, certainly when your head's full, you need to be alone. You need time without other conversation and other things. Like you that. are never alone. Ah. You, you're not. You know, there are people out there who need you, even when you don't want to talk to them. Right? You need a break from them. But but the fact that they need you is what keeps you going. So, even if, you know, you, when you're married, even if you're separated by an ocean, you're not alone. And what makes you not alone is not somebody loves you. Then you're still alone. Somebody needs you, you're not alone anymore. So the experts are just starting to catch on. All the emphasis on getting more pleasure and more love out of your relationship. It's killing the relationship. Because it makes it about you, doesn't it? Instead yeah. of yeah, trying to make it about the other funny, person. Funny story. A guy walks up to me, just random, like at some event, and he's staring at me, and he says, can I ask you a question? Most people do. He says, do you sleep with your beard under the blanket or the beard <laughs> on top of the blanket? And, and how did he, you respond? He was trying to be funny. I couldn't sleep for two weeks. Oh, because all you thought about was, what do I do with my beard? You become self-conscious. Huh. And all of a sudden, nothing works. Oh. So you want to ruin a good marriage? Very easy. Take the husband aside and say, uh, the intimacy and you know, sex with your wife is pretty good. Oh, God. That's it. You've killed him. <laughs> aside from being wildly inappropriate. <laughs> You've killed it. I, I, yeah, I, th I thought so. No, maybe not. Oh, that's it. You've killed it. 
every magazine, every movie, every mm -hmm. creates self-consciousness. Right. So the intimacy becomes a performance, mm. which produces anxiety. Yeah. That's it. You've killed it. Well, and, and I feel like if we even apply that to purpose, because then if we start asking the question to someone, you know, about purpose, do we do we introduce self-consciousness no. in that? You don't believe so. Okay. Tell me if more. you're really talking about purpose, no. Because the whole definition of purpose is other consciousness. Mm. Who needs you? It's not self-conscious. Mm. So here's the amazing, <laughs> tragic reality. Love and sex are destroying marriages. Whoa, wait, hold on. You're uh -huh, blowing my uh -huh, mind uh -huh. right now. <laughs> blown. Blown, mind blown. Well, I mean, I, I'll go along with, on this line with you. Please tell me more. Marriage means connecting with another human being, not with a function, not with some thing about the person. That's why we feel so alone. Even when we're in a love relationship, a passionate relationship, but we're totally alone because we're just connecting in things, mm. not to each other. Like if a man says, I want to marry you for your money, what does that mean? Well, he's connecting to a thing. All right. So people say, oh, oh, that's no good. Why? Why? What's, what's wrong with it? Well, what if the money disappears? Is that the only problem? <laughs> <laughs> if the money doesn't disappear, then it's good. He's married to the money, not to her. So what's the problem? She's alone in the world. Yeah. Worse than lonely. Alone. Nobody needs her. They just need her money. Why is love any better? Oh, don't marry for money, because what if the money goes away? <laughs> what if the love goes away? Yeah. Which is more likely. So then what do you think, what do you think people should do ahead of marriage, in, in advance of marriage? Should it be a conversation of need? Um, what do you need? Let me help fill your needs. I mean, what, what's the proper conversation? Well, certainly not, can you help me with my need? Mm. So if you really want to be loved or need to be loved, don't get married. Don't do this to somebody. Mm. Go home to your mother. <laughs> She'll love you. She has a need for you. <laughs> so the experts are now admitting that they made a big mistake. Couples don't need more pleasure. In fact, Nobody today needs more pleasure. Oh, I mean, we're such a hedonistic society at this point. I mean, we have everything. We, we have, have everything. We have chocolate. We have chocolate. Who needs marriage? We have chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we have wine. It's fine. <laughs> really oh. true. We don't need more pleasure. So all these articles on the 13 secrets to better sex, to getting more pleasure, we don't need it. Yeah. Stop it. So what we need is to be needed? We need closeness. That's what the experts are saying now. They're using the word closeness. Is that proximity? Physical proximity or that, emotional? That wouldn't hurt either. The average couple, married or just living together, the average couple, according to the latest polls, are intimate once a month if they're lucky. They're in the same house, in the same bedroom, in the same bed, and they're intimate once a month. I wonder what the age spread was on that. Yeah, it's a Pew, it's a Pew uh, hmm. study. Wow. And I know that that's true just from talking to people. Wow. So love is not doing it. And sex is not doing it. In fact, sex has become very unpopular. It's burdensome. It's messy. It's, it's, it's boring. So then the answer is need. The answer is closeness. Closeness. But what does that, what does that mean? What does that entail? Yeah. How do you get close? Love doesn't bring you close because love is selfish. Is I mean, is the answer sharing? Is the answer sharing what? Well, sharing your heart. Ah, well, what uh, what does that mean? Ah, I I would say sharing your thoughts, sharing, um, you know. Maybe even asking the question of the needs of the other person. What do you need? What can I help do for you? 
which people say all the time is the ultimate expression of love, putting your, putting someone else before yourself. Meaning? Oh, uh, I don't know. That's, Res I mean, I would think that's when you love and respect someone. Is no, you do those putting things. someone before you means putting their needs. Before your needs. Okay. So you remember the song from Fiddler on the Roof? Tevye asks his wife, do you love me? And she says, what? <laughs> <laughs> do I what? He says, do you love me? And she sings a song yeah. about how she does his lot. For 25 years, she I washed your clothes, and I've made your meals, and I've been... Blah, blah, blah. If that's not love, what is? What she's saying is, you're wondering whether I love you? You're wondering whether I'm giving you my love? I give you me. Mm. So, yeah, the love is probably included. But what, what are you, a baby? <laughs> Why are you focusing on the love? You have me. Mm. All of me. Closeness. Other. You have someone other than yourself. Not something. And not even many things. So, are others the foundation of purpose then? Yes because I am not enough. And that begins with God. God creates the world because he's not enough for himself. Now, if that's not humble and vulnerable, I don't know what is. So here we have a whole new God. God is invulnerable? You're kidding. Yeah, and it's interesting. He is the most vulnerable. So it's interesting when you say that because the whole foundation, I think, of um, you know so many religions is that God created man in His image, in His likeness. So if His image is vulnerable, then we would also be that. Exactly true. Why do we hate being alone? Because we're like Him. Yeah, and we were made to be that way. Exactly mm. right. It's interesting. So how does somebody find purpose then? Is it starting by looking around? Is that the first step? Look around? Where am I needed? Yeah. Start from the bottom. Yeah. Or start from the top. Ask God. You need me? <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> yeah. So now it turns out that we have a whole new view of the Bible. We always thought the Bible is an instruction manual for what we need to do. Hmm but I don't have needs. The Bible is God's diary. Here's what I need. And there's a big choice. We got 10 commandments, 613 commandments. You, you, there's so many ways you can do for him. So God comes down to Mount Sinai not to tell us what to do, to tell us what he needs. Now, do as many of them as you can. Yeah. This is called serving him, not using him to get to heaven. Hmm. It's it's interesting. I've never heard I've never heard someone say the things you say. Do you feel like you're alone in those concepts? Or are there others now starting to echo the sentiments? There's been some some resistance, hmm. which makes it interesting. Yeah. But they're just questions. What's wrong with asking a question? Yeah, the problem is they're not asking questions. They're just stuck in their, no, 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 no. God doesn't need. We are needy. Okay, habits are hard to break, especially mental habits. Mm. But when people do respond to it, and most, most people do, I mean, there are people who say, I don't believe in God. I'm not interested. I'm not religious. I don't believe in God. So, yeah, but, but God is depending on you. He is? He's counting on you. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, so, so you're not an atheist? <laughs> They're an atheist because they don't want to believe in a God who sits in heaven doing nothing, watching us suffer. But you're telling me God needs me? Oh, now I'm in. Yeah. So all of a sudden the atheist is not an atheist anymore. That's amazing. Where does, where does personal choice come in or personal taste come in or, or personal desires and the things that, you know, if each of us are born with gifts, talents, 
with a specific purpose, at what point do we begin to discover those things, explore those things, be curious about those things, and fold those into the needs of other people? So those are all givens. Those are not choices. I can't choose to be talented. Or I can't choose which talent I'm going to have. Those are given. The question is why? Why were you given your talent? I was given my talent. You were given your weakness. I was given my weakness. We didn't do any of that. It's all given. So it all goes under the question of what does God need with this? Mm. So if you're giving me a talent, how do you want me to use it? You're giving me a weakness? What do you want me to do with it? Maybe find somebody who has the strength <clears throat> in our weakness. So we're developing closeness. But and there's not a aloneness. purpose to it, right? Yeah. What am I supposed to do with the weakness you gave me? <laughs> so it's not like human beings are so disgusting, they're so, you know, greedy, and they're so, hey, hey, we didn't do this. Get off my back. <laughs> stop blaming me for everything yeah. and stop burdening me with responsibilities. Just tell me. Why am I here? Complicated? It's I mean it's so interesting because they are it is simple. It is it as your to your point. It's incredibly simple, but it's so antithetical Real. almost from what we've what we've always believed yes. or the way we've always thought. But we live in a very exciting time. There have been exciting discoveries, inventions, progress really exciting. It doesn't compare to the excitement that's coming. Mm, tell me what you think is coming. We're going to discover why we're here. Why everything. I remember the World's Fair back in the 50s. And the big thing was electric dishwashers. <laughs> There's a great big beautiful tomorrow coming because we have a washing machine. <laughs> Well, it's so interesting because when we, when I consider even just the line, of your, your thought process here, as we have evolved, just even in the last 100 years, we've created things that have taken need away, right? We've had these need, I have to wash the dishes, I need to do this, I need to do that, I, I need to heat up the food. Well, the microwave does that. I need to wash the dishes, the dishwasher does that. I need to wash the clothes, the laundry, you know, washer dryer does that. Yep. And so as we've been taking needs away from ourselves, what are we left with? Time to think. Yeah. And then you get yourself into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> then you start asking why. Yeah. See, people in affluent societies are more likely to get depressed than people in third world countries because they have the time to ask, to wonder. When you're busy surviving, you have no time to ask questions. It's the truth, yeah. So now that we're affluent and now that we're comfortable and we have a dishwasher, now we're in trouble. <laughs> What's it all for? What do you think is coming with this level of consciousness that you're describing? And how far away would you say we are? With the internet, it can happen overnight. Because as soon as we get a good answer, everyone will know it instantly. Hmm. Everyone. So it turns out that uh, what we always refer to as messianic, utopia, a perfected world, all it means is stop being needy <laughs> and figure out who needs you and you have a perfect world. Yeah. You don't have to change personalities. You don't have to do lobotomies. Just... Stop with the, with the yeah. unnatural neediness, which everyone is willing to jettison. I'd drop it in a second if I could. Yeah. Just make it legitimate. Do you think that's been the problem all along, is as we've had more time to think, we've started maybe reevaluating? I mean, that's not the problem, I guess. That's, that's the beginning of the solution, is the reevaluation. Yeah. So first, when we had freedom, of freedom, of freedom and time, we got ourselves deeper into... I need, I need, and we realize, no, this is depressing. Mm. It's more, actually, it's morbid. I don't know why I'm here. 
I didn't ask to be born, but I'm going to have to suffer. <laughs> I'm going to have to suffer through this thing yeah. called life. Yeah. That's... Why would anybody agree to hang around for that? <laughs> yeah. Which that means to me, the only antidote is to find who needs you. The only antidote to life is to find purpose. Which is what we've been asking all along. Mm -hmm. We just didn't realize how essential that question is. Yeah. We thought it was a eh, nice philosophical discussion. No. I, I feel like I, I don't know if it's my age or uh, maybe it's my understanding of people with purpose, um, maybe because I'm surrounded by those type of people all the time, it does feel like more people are discovering purpose. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like such an unusual thing. Um, and we do have this celebrity culture where we like to put on pedestals people who are just maybe even famous for being famous. Do who you think don't need you? Who don't need you? That's the problem. And I wonder, do you think there will be a point where the pedestal actually becomes the people who figured it out? Or is that time coming? For sure. It's already, it's already here. But you attract that. You attract those kinds of people because that's you. You're very aware of purpose and of being needed. I feel that. Yeah. I don't think I was always that way. I actually think I was, I was attracting that before I realized it. Because as people, I mean, it really did start as stories that I was doing uh, from the television station I work for. It's these stories I was looking to tell these people's, these people, people's personal journeys, and I found them to be so incredible. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I realized later, two years later, it's purpose. Purpose is what all of these people have in common. Their stories are always different, but they've they've done something that that's not about. This is how I how I coin it. It's not about the me. It's about the we. And purpose, true purpose is not there until it's about we. Other. We, other. Someone other than yourself. It's not about the exaltation of self. So look, look, look at what happened to Superman. When it was first introduced, what was Superman? Someone who was here to serve the world. Someone who was here to respond to your needs. And it inspired a whole more than one generation. But look at what happened recently. He has needs. He's, he's you know, got problems. He's got his origin story to deal with. People hate him. He has identity crisis. And what are you, do what are you doing? <laughs> it's terrible that kids are raised with superheroes who don't need anybody. Arrogant top-of-the-world people, that's the role model? It's not good. The traditional and enduring uh, fairy tales that have been repeated for the last 200 years or so is always about a simple bumpkin, country bumpkin, simpleton, who in his own innocent, naive way does something for the king. It's not the king who's the hero. It's the one who serves the king. That was such a healthy message. Mm. But now, no, no, no. Everybody's got to be the king. Everybody's got to be super. Distorted it. Ruined it. Did religion have a hand in that, you think? Yes, because religion also makes God into a super being who needs nobody, needs nothing. So if you want to be like him, Need nobody, need nothing. It's terrible. It's monstrous. So every guy f grows up trying to be perfect, which means I don't need you. Mm. That's perfect. That's horrendous. How, how did your life change when you decided to start not just asking those questions, but living in that sort of sphere? Since, I don't know, it was like when I was six, 16, 17, Wow. I mean, this is your it was, practically your entire life. Yeah. It was all about answering questions, sharing the information, correcting the mistakes. Always, like, haven't had a private life since. And it is wonderful. Mm. What, when do you find that you feel most alive in that? I mean, because that, that is... That is your purpose, right? To ask these questions, to turn concepts on their head. 
Do you find that activated at certain parts, at certain times for you? That you feel like, this, this is why I'm here. And when are those times? I was traveling and uh, come to the city in Mexico. And the, the rabbi there tells me that there's a couple who desperately needs to talk to me. They had a tragedy. They're turned off. They're not participating. They're not. They're. They're. They're miserable. They're. And they won't. They won't talk to anybody anymore. Mm. But they would talk to me, coming from out of town. You know, something different. Okay, I was not very excited about this because. You know, what do you say to somebody who's? Anyway, I'm introduced to this young couple. They had a six-year-old daughter who died from an aneurysm, mm. which means she died instantly. She was alive and then she was gone. And they weren't home when it happened. Oh. They showed me a picture of the little girl and they were just a, an angel. Yeah. Anyway, they're, they're, they're angry at God. They, they used to be more observant and more religious, not, not more. They want to leave the community because they can't stand the community anymore. And they don't want to hear from rabbis and from people and nobody knows what to tell them. And they're just frustrated out of their minds. Mm. So I said, uh, has your daughter communicated with you yet? Oh, nobody asked me that. Did she, did she not answer the question? The father said yes, twice. Wow. I said, what did she say? He said, she didn't say anything. She just smiled to let me know that she's okay. Mm. I said, and she did it twice? Why? I said, what, what she's trying to tell you is that she is okay if you would let her. Mm. But you being so upset and so angry and, and not doing what you're supposed to be doing because of her, how does a six-year-old handle that kind of responsibility? So you're her father, and look how you're treating her. She's six years old. Just because she's on the other side of the, of the fence, she's still six years old. She still needs a father. Wow. So you became a mourner instead of a father. And she doesn't need a mourner. She needs you to be her father. So think of what's best for her and do it. Were they codfish, slack-jawed? What, what were they when you had that? Absolutely transformed. Wow. They, they just came back to life. Those moments, I know I'm on the right track. For two or three of those moments, 50 years of effort is worth everything. I was talking to a woman who also had a terrible tragedy, and she was severely depressed, hadn't left her apartment in six months, wouldn't talk to anybody. She was just dying. She finally agreed to talk to me. I go over to her apartment, and she, she was not among the living. Hmm. She was gone. Wow. There was... There was death in the air. And she tells me her 19-year-old son died in a car accident. And he was, he was an ideal son, the best of the best, thoughtful, considerate, respectful, unbelievable. So when she finishes describing all that, I said, wow, you had him for 19 years. She was not impressed. I said, it's the shock that's, that's so painful. Imagine there was no shock. If God had come to you and said, there's a fantastic, exceptional soul that needs to be born for 19 years, and I need someone to be his mother. If God would say, would you be the mother of this really special kid for 19 years? What would you have said? And I was sure she would say yes. She said, absolutely not. So I said, well, then it's a good thing God didn't ask you. Mm. She fell apart. 
she broke down and sobbed for 20 minutes and came back to life. Mm. Literally the resurrection of the dead in 20 minutes. Those experiences are... They're everything, right? And again, it's the same idea. Why did she suddenly break down? She needed that cry for six months. It's because she realized she had just said no to her son. What kind of mother does that? See, she had stopped being a mother. She became a griever. But when I said, you would say no to your son, then it's a good thing God didn't ask you. She said, really, what did I say? Did I just say no to my son? Mm. I don't want him unless he lives more than 19 years. She became a mother again. Yeah. She cried like a mother, not like a griever. Yeah. And then therein lies the purpose of all of it, right? Is the is that sacrifice of self to serve the needs of someone else, to be a servant. So is that the purpose in all of our lives, is to be a servant? Of service. Of service. Yeah. That's, that's the Jewish concept. We're here to serve God, not to have him serve us. Mm. And that's why we're still Jewish, because if we're waiting for him to serve us, he's not doing such a good job. <laughs> I mean, Jewish history is one long misery. <laughs> if we're trying to get something from him, it's not working. Hmm. But we're not. So no matter what happens, what can I do for you? Hmm. And that keeps us outliving everybody. Yeah. Mark Twain, again, had that very famous little piece on, how come the Jews are still here? Now well, there's the answer. Because we're not needy. We're needed. Yeah. And that's why you have a radio show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To do these sort of conversations. Yes. Because you're looking to be needed. Mm. To serve. Did I say radio show? Yeah, it's okay. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's, uh, you know, it's the auditory. It's the video. It's all of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So what'd you think? Tell me in the comments below, like it, share it with someone who needs to hear it. I'm adding new videos all the time to help you reconnect with self and then prepare for purpose. And since you're here, I've gone ahead and linked my playlist, the episode Amplified. It gives shorter clips from each episode, still though very much power packed with encouragement. It's all right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.